This is Leaders Who Scale, and I'm Jeff Siegel. I've worked with thousands of companies over the years, and I'm fascinated by seeing how many of them grow and scale. Join me as we learn from the leaders of growing companies and share that knowledge. Leaders Who Scale is sponsored by Siegel Solutions, providing world-class accounting, advisory, and QuickBooks and Acumatica Cloud ERP services. Today's guest is a champion of small business, an accounting aficionado, the co-founder of accountingdepartment.com, the premier outsourced bookkeeping, accounting, controller, and advisory services company in North America. It was a company that was started in 2004, has grown from the two co-founders to 165 full-time employees, and they're still growing. And they were one of the first initial companies that actually embraced remote work because before anyone else really did. So I want to welcome Dennis Najjar. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Good, Dennis. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. Just another day at the shop. <laughs> As usual. Yep. <laughs> so, you know, when I first started doing this podcast and chatting with leaders who um, have been successfully scaling their companies, you, uh, you and Bill from accountingdepartment.com, really, they came, you came to mind. So I really wanted to get, get on, on a conversation with you and kind of see how it's, how it's going and what you're doing, what makes you guys successful. Well, I, I'd say, you know, success really comes down to people. And it's a cliche -ish thing you hear all the time, uh, but there is nothing a close second to having the right people and more importantly, getting them in the right seat as that expression goes on the bus. Now that may actually be easier than it sounds because part of that is getting them to see what their potential is uh, sometimes. Uh, but once you start getting pieces in the right place, uh, things begin to click a lot easier. Uh, and so really the, the, the first and foremost thing is, is people. Yeah. So I, I assume that you talk about people that really has been the most challenging aspect. So, I mean, how has it worked out? You've been doing this now for some 18 years. Um, yep. I'm sure that there weren't all successes and, um, some stumbling blocks here and there with people and. You know, they, you know, have they, um, successfully moved into the right seat or have you had to, you know, um, kind of convince them they may have been in the wrong seat in the first place. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a combination of everything. You know, it's funny on every given day, you think, you know, what could actually be new today. And, and there's always surprises. Uh, there's always new things that are coming up. Uh, and sometimes people easily slide into those seats and, and other times uh, they don't and you have to work with them. Other times you see that potential uh, for them and, and you've, you've got to help them along. You've got to you know, mentor them over a period of time for them to find their potential. And I can think of a number of people who came in basically as what we call accounting specialists would be our entry level person and who have now grown over a course of three years and in, in as short as three years and over a period of seven years or more where they're now in leadership positions, where they are involved in implementation or they're involved in technology more than just doing bookkeeping. Mm. Uh, so, you know, some of those skills kind of pop out as you're working with them and you begin to keep an eye on somebody. Uh, and then other times it's really just encouraging. I can remember one young lady who you know, she came in to, to do bookkeeping basically, and she felt that's all the qualifications she had. But when I began working with her, and it was a number of years ago, so I was really working with staff more directly at that time, I, I saw that she had so much more potential. She was sharp. She was on point. She, she got it right. She followed it. She understood it. And I said to her, you have more potential than this. And she didn't believe it at first. And uh, over the course of a couple of opportunities to get promoted, she did. And now she's actually a supervisor, which is like four levels up in our implementation department. So she went from an entry level position to a, a supervisor. She's actually responsible for onboarding clients. And, you know, that's like taming a wild horse that you find <laughs> when you first bring on a client, right? Yeah. Not for the faint of heart, as we like to say. No, not at all. Not, not every client is the same. It seems like there's always right. something new with yeah. these clients. Um, so it sounds like you, you guys spent a lot of time on um, professional development and, you know, team building exercises and that sort of thing. I mean, well, culture, 
Yeah, culture is extremely important. And being virtual from day one, we, uh, you know, we had to figure it out from day one. And and it really, it's just a matter of being an average Joe as the owner of the company, right? one of the co-founders, uh, relating to people, sort of, you know, rolling up your sleeves and, and trying to let them know that you're not on some high pedestal, you know, it, just barking orders that you, things you want done, that um, it's, it's, it's a team effort. There's no doubt. And actually, I, you know, I, Bill and I, we talk to every new employee. We've been doing this for years. So when they first come in within the first week, they spend an hour with each one of us. And uh, when I meet, I'm usually the first person that meets with the new people after they've been here for a day or two. And when I meet with them, I, t uh, you know, I say, after I go through a whole history of the company, just kind of give a, a quick background. I say, well, I like to talk about our organizational chart for a moment. Um, and, you know, right away that conjures up pictures of, you know, two boxes at the top and it, yeah. you know, they're the lowly accounting specialists at the bottom. And I, I say that to them. And then I turn around and I say, but that's not the organizational chart that we have here. The organizational chart that we have here actually puts you at the top. You are the most important group of people in this organization. And at first they don't believe it, you know, it sounds cliche ish. Right. Yeah. Um, and then I go on to build my case as to why, and it's a real simple one. Actually. Um, I said, I don't generate any revenue in this company you generate most of the revenue and you're dealing with the clients every day of every week of every month. And it's your relationship with those clients that is going to get them to make the decision to want to pay us again next month. And so the support system that we have in place is that when you have a challenge, you go to your supervisor, whoever that might be, one of the controllers or assistant controllers, you know, that's who you go to. And if they can't fix that situation with the client, then they would, bring it to Bill and I, and that becomes our mm -hmm. responsibility. And they are like amazed to hear that they're the most important people. And I, and I kind of go on and I say to them, you know, we're pretty simple guys. I'll tell you what I live by. It's the golden rule. And it is very straightforward. You know what it is. Do unto others as you, as you want to do unto yourself. And I say, I live and breathe that as the life of, of me as a person. And I say, I wouldn't want to put myself in an awkward or an uncomfortable or an ugly situation. So why would I think it's okay for me to do that? And most people don't hear that within a company. You know, they hear that you're just there to produce and do a job and, you know, grind. And we really do value our people. So that culture, that mentality, uh, you know, goes from A to Z, from the beginning to the end of time with every person. And they do not just hear it, they live and breathe it. Well, I'm curious, like you have 165 employees and they're all remote. So right. I'm just curious how you actually keep that culture going, right? Because you're not in this, it's not like you, you're hanging out at the, at the water cooler, you know, and yep. right. checking in. And so I'm, I'm curious how that, that all works with this environment that you're in. We spend a lot of time on Zoom, believe it or not. Zoom with, it's a, an unwritten rule, if you will. You're on camera. So, and we don't care what's below your waist. In fact, we don't care what's going on behind you. It's, it's the way work is today. Things have shifted in the workplace. You know, early on, we would have, a, you know, more issues, if you will, with, you know, kids in the background and dogs barking and, you know, that kind of stuff. But today it's a little bit more acceptable. It's not unprofessional, but it's a little bit more acceptable. And yeah, we have, no. a, and we have a lot of those meetings in different types of groups. You know, it's true because when I first started working on Zoom, I had like the um, green screen and, um, you know, fake backgrounds. And, right. But I noticed over time, people were like, hey, we want to see, you know, the authentic person we're talking. Right, right. The exception, like you said, of, you know, people walking behind you and, uh, yeah. you know, dogs barking. But um, it turned more into that, you know, just, you know, to don't, you know, be yourself. In, like, be yourself right exactly yeah. you know some people like the background because it, it you know they may not be in the best situation behind them it might be cluttered it might be you know whatever there could be their bedroom um you know and so we, we do appreciate when they when they do that to some extent but you're right um it's nice to see what's behind the curtain um sure. as you can see i have a, a background on and then not that i have anything it's not comfortable to see it's just a slogan i like to you know keep out there in the front of every conversation that i'm having no it's great i mean it's it, your service is right there, right? Bookkeeping, yep. control advisory. So, no, oh, that's yep. great. Um, the, the other question I really have is um, on, you know, you, you 
you've kind of scaled pretty rapidly over the, you know, even though it's been 16 or so years, um, 17, 18, I guess. Um, yeah. 18. Come yeah. Go, to go from like, you know, two employees, you, you and Bill. And I think you mentioned at one point you used to go out and set these remote workers up, um, to 165. It seems like, you know, you, you got one foot on the hiring and, you know, process where you're setting up new employees or team members. And the other side is like, you're trying to grow a business you know, with strategy and, you know, um, direction and, you know, your goals and all that stuff. So to kind of straddle on both sides, sounds like it could be a difficult process. I'm not sure how you guys have, have done that. Well, you know, in the early days we were doing everything. Um, we would, you know, go through the resumes that came to the website. We'd interview people. Bill was handling the marketing. I was doing the training of the new staff. You're right. I used to fly all over the country because back then there was no USB devices that you could plug a monitor in that every you know, average person could do. So I literally would show up at someone's doorstep with a monitor in one hand and a video card in the next. And I'd walk in like the crazy professor. And the first thing I'd say after hello is where's your computer? And I'd you know, I'd start ripping it apart to get a video card in so they could have multiple monitors. And then I was there. Uh, and so I would spend a day or so trying to get them acclimated. But things have, you know, to get to 160 people, you have to build infrastructure. And, and that's what we have. We have a sales and marketing team. We have an HR department. I have my own accounting department, if you will, within the accounting department. Um, we have uh, a trainer. We have all of these things. We have an administration. So all of these functions now do what might appear to be uh, overwhelming. So our training department, you know, they're the ones that will initially bring people in. They're going to go through a month long training process. They're never doing an hour's worth of billable work for the first month. We've got to get them up to speed on all the nuances of what we do. Because in the end, we do have a business that you're trying to deliver an experience mm -hmm. that is consistent among all the different staff. And so you've got to establish that baseline of how we do things, why we do things, when we do things. So the consistency can be there. So that department is responsible for training. Um, HR is responsible. We have three people in HR, two of them are doing recruiting. So all of those functions are now decentralized from Bill and I, and our role at this point is we are simply meeting with department heads, getting updates on where things are and helping make decisions about changes or things that they want to, you know, do differently. How was that from a you know, transition from that? early days where you were kind of, um, obviously doing everything, wearing a ton of hats to now you have people doing a lot of that stuff that report to you and, and you're more on the kind of the, you're working on the business instead of necessarily in the business. Was that a, was there an, a point that you, you said, Hey, geez, we're not really dealing with as many clients as we used to, or we're starting to do more of this. Was there like a pivotal point in the kind of the business? In the history, uh, history of, yeah well, yeah you know interestingly enough when bill and i first met and we're in my office for the very first time and we're sort of talking about our aspirations and we're really understanding what each of us are going to bring to the table and it's really what the other one of us needs and at the end of that conversation you know we're, we we've agreed we you know if you will kind of picture standing up over the conference table extending your hand and saying we're going to be partners to each other. Um, and then we sit back down and we, and, you know, we kind of pull out the proverbial napkin and we say, okay, what are our two goals for this business? Right. And they were very simple at that point. One was to grow it. Um, and the second one was to not work in it, but to work on it. So really from day one, while I said, I, I did work with the initial staff. I mean, we brought on our first controller probably after about three years. Okay. So the business was pretty much in an infancy at that stage. We might've had 15 or 20 people. It was still manageable for me to do it, but it was an important phase because by doing it, I knew how to prepare someone else to take it over. Mm -hmm. If I just brought it in and said, you know, here you go, take this from there. It, it, it probably would have had a lot more ups and downs along the way. So really from almost day one, our goal was to work on the business. What wasn't there was the right people. First of all, we didn't have the financial capabilities to bring all these departments in. They started to, you know, come along over a period of years. And then once the departments were conceptually there, it was somewhat having a trial and error to get the right person in there. And frankly, we do have a great team right now, the marketing and the sales department, they're just humming along training, 
uh, and, and you know, and operations with the with the with the staff is a finely tuned. And then our HR uh, is just blowing it out of the water, and, and you know, the hustle that they do to constantly bring us uh, new 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 team members. So once that's there, it's a lot easier. You're just like I say, you're dealing with you know what are the decisions that have to be made. So I mean, you must they must have challenges like we all are now with just staffing, right? And getting the right people. You, you mentioned earlier, you know, on, in the right seat, but we're still, we're, st we're having challenges as a company. I think most companies are just finding the right people to get on the bus, um, never mind in the right seat. So I'm not sure what you're, you're seeing on your side. Uh, well, I'd like to make a joke about it and say that we're in some sort of, you know, uh, land of make believe that we're not exposed to that, but we're in the same predicament everyone else is. Uh, you know, it's funny because at first when this started to become a topic of conversation, we actually thought it was something we were doing wrong, you know, and we, so we inter reflected on ourselves to say, okay, what do we need to change so that this situation, you know, doesn't continue on. And of course, over a shorter period of time, we, we began to see you know, other businesses, the press and, and, you know, all of the other, you know, awareness that came about from what they now call the great resignation. And so I'm, I'm glad to report we're in the same boat you are, if that makes you feel any better. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yes. <laughs> Misery loves company. Misery loves company. <laughs> right. Say it, but yeah. Yeah. I'm just waiting for the, you know. Waiting for it to turn around. I'm not sure what it'll be. And I'm not sure whether we have to change the way we do business or the way we train or what type of um, people we bring in the door. So it's. You know, well, I, I can't tell you that. If, yeah. I, I, Jill, mind me commenting on that. Yeah. Um, this might be of interest. Um, we have shifted. Uh, you know, we were hardcore for many years, you know, nine to five full time. That's what we wanted. You know, we had more work than we really could handle. So we didn't really want to have one of these flexible workforces. Um, but in the last two years, we have conceded to some of that. And we now offer a flex schedule. Uh, we don't offer part-time because it's just not good client mix, but we do offer flex. We've always offered flexibility, uh, yeah. but we now offer a flex time where someone could elect to work 35 rather than 40 hours. Okay. And that has seemed to attract people, but it also has enabled a few people who were struggling with that 40 hour work week to say, okay, I can make this work if I can get to 35 hours. You know, there are a lot of them are moms and you know, we're proud of the work life balance that we live and die by. And that's one of those things we preach during the recruiting process, the onboarding process, when they meet with me, I'm, I'm reinforcing because a lot of times you hear these things and then you come to find out they're not true. But in our organization, they are very true. We live and die by them. We make sure people are always going to their kids' events and going to the doctor and taking care of their pets. Pets are family members in our world. And, and we say this all the time. I tell stories of, you know, I had a pet pass away last uh, summer sometime. And my wife was very distraught because um, she's very close to the pet. And so I told Bill, I said, I'm, I'm not coming in today. I, I'm going to spend the day with Lisa, you know, because we had to put the pet to, to sleep. And never, never, never faith. But by saying that publicly, it only reinforces that this is a philosophy that holds true in the company. Um, and so all of the managers live in, you know, are in this same situation. And so no one ever gets any pushback or you know, funny faces or, you know, mumbling under their breath about somebody wanting to take care of their personal because the next day it could be them. So it's a great, it's really a great, uh, a great vibe, if you will. Yeah. So we've done a lot, we have a lot of flex time too, with our, you know, our own team members. Um, some of the challenges that we face, and I'm not sure how you, um, get around this is really kind of monitoring, you know, they what they're doing as far as, are they taking advantage of the flex time? Are they, you know, working less than you, than you think they are working? Um, you know, just that sort of thing, you know, because you have them all over the country. Do you actually monitor them? Is it more of just, are they providing the right customer service and services they should be doing? And, you know, you monitor it that way for, through task management or however else you do it. We do have a, a number of tools in place, but it's not intended to be a uh, big daddy overlooking them. Yeah. It's a very, it's a very simple philosophy. And this is what they hear in the recruiting process. And then they hear it again when they start with me. 
and I and I say this, and it, it's kind of like it's for my benefit, not yours. Our family first, our flexibility philosophy, is actually worth more to me than it is to you. And they're like, "Huh? What does that mean?" Because I find that if you treat people right, they're going to give you 110, 120 percent without you asking for it. And so we really don't feel that there is any of that taking advantage going on. There might be something. I mean, I'm not going to say I'm naive about it, but it's not a, a massive amount of time stealing um, because what we have basically said is we're going to treat you right. And all we ask is, is the respect back. So when you respect people, then you get a different outcome rather than when you try to you know, monitor them or micromanage them or, you know, big daddy them, that's when they, you know, will begin to resent the organization. And I think look for ways to sort of get one up on the man as the expression yeah. goes. Yeah. Maybe I'm naive, but again, I believe in the, I'm going to treat yeah. you the way I would want to be treated. And I wouldn't want to be micromanaged that way. So I don't believe that I should ask, you know, do that the other direction. Yeah. And isn't that always for us? I was just curious because when I, we started uh, hiring outside of our local region, uh, mm -hmm. it took us a while. Um, you know, I, I, I started looking at programs, like how do I know what they're working on? And, but then, like you said, I felt like I was, you know, big brother watching over them. There's software out that'll tell you how many hours are spending on this, that, and the other thing. And, um, I started the thinking, budget. thinking it was a good idea and it, I, I never yeah. put it in place, but I said, I, I can't do this. I just felt yeah creepy about the whole concept. Listen, every project has a budget for it. Yeah. And the, and the, and the employee is responsible for that budget and the supervisor's responsible for that employee. So there's a check and a balance there. We do have a task management sir, uh, system, which is intended to keep track of the to do's. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not actually used to, you know, whip out and say, oh, you're behind by three days on this, or you should have done sure. that yesterday not really the intent. The intent is to make sure everything is top of mind for them. Yep. And then there's always comes down to the client experience. If that client experience is positive, then they're getting the job done. And, uh, you know, if that budget is, you know, if they're not coming in at 20, 30, 40% over budget, then that client experience is working for us as well. Sure. Yeah. Do you, do you, pro do you get feedback from your clients? Is there, is in, on a, in a, in a formal way, as opposed to just, Hey, how's it going? Is do you actually track, you know, I guess, you know, uh, net promoter score, I guess I'd call it, but you know, um, there are tools out there that larger companies will use like, you know, uh, survey monkeys, things like that. I'm just curious, do you, do you do that for your clients or there's a couple, there's a couple of things that we do. We, uh, we, we have begun implementing net promoter score. Uh, and so we've started in one or two departments and we're just testing it out kind of getting the right combination of questions, frequency of those questions. You don't want to over, you know, you know hit them too often. You don't want to be yeah. too infrequent. So we're looking for that right balance on that. Um, we expect by the end of this year, we'll have it rolled it out across all departments. Nice. Uh, the other thing that we, we do is that uh, for the managers, at least uh, the, the CPAs, the controllers, uh, we do call their clients uh, in advance of their annual review and hmm. talk to them get feedback. So we'll send out an email that says, here's six questions. If you have a few minutes, we'd like to schedule an appointment. It's better to do it by appointment. But if you don't, if you could give us some feedback to these six questions, that would be wonderful. And then we take all that feedback and that becomes part of their annual review process. It's only once a year right now, because mm -hmm. it is a little bit labor intensive. You keep imposing upon the client to give you more of their time, whether it be for a, you know, a zoom meeting or to answer questions. So right now we're doing it once a year, uh, but it, it, it is a valuable uh, feedback tool, not only for their, you know, obviously their interpretation of our services, which is always the most important thing, right? What do they think yeah. of what we're doing? Not what do, what do we think we're doing? <laughs> um, but it also gives us opportunity to talk about areas that we can um, add, add more value. Yeah. Provide them more services. It's not the intent. But inevitably, some of those calls turn into kind of a wish list from the from the client side. Yeah, it's like That's I'm helpful. glad you called. Um, you know, right? You guys, help us with this or that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I know there's some. I don't want to call it performance management software out there, but there's stuff out there where I've seen some of the larger companies. 
it's almost year round where they can put up kudos and hey, great job. And, yeah. you know, um, they almost take their goals and align it with that, that software. And then throughout the year, there's constant feedback. And then you could print out at the end of the year, like, you know, the, a yearly, you know, uh, recap list of all the stuff, yeah. you know, and help with reviews. So we don't do something as formula as that, but we, we do get kudos on a regular un unsolicited kudos from clients, uh, on a regular basis. And it could be about the accounting specialist who's on the engagement, or it could be about the controller, it could be at a, spe a special project. Yeah. What we do is we highlight those in our, uh, our, our biweekly team meetings. Okay. And so we reserve a spot at the end for someone who's involved in that engagement to speak up and, you know, talk about the kudos for the other team members. Nice. Uh, and so it's a, it's a nice recognition program. Uh, for them to acknowledge. Uh, in fact, I just did one um, for somebody that something came across my desk and the person who would, who that person reported to wasn't on the meeting. They were out for the day. So I decided not to let the opportunity go by. And so I gave her recognition for this project she had been working on that I had heard about that she really knocked through the, through the park, out of the park. Oh. And uh, that got back to her boss who then came to me and said, you know, she was really impressed and you remembered it and you said something. And that's what this is all about. Yeah. You're treating people the right way. It's how you would want to be treated. It's sincere. It's not mechanical. It's not uh, automatic. Yeah, no, it sounds great. It sounds like it's a great environment that you have, um, especially like you mentioned, these biweekly meetings, giving them kudos. Yep. Flexibility. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's working. Um, and, we, and we do some other crazy things like we do a, a pizza party after 1099 season. Now, just imagine when we first started this, we probably had about 40 people. It was very manageable. You're talking yeah. about ordering pizzas in 40 different cities to be delivered to someone's home, right? right. <laughs> We're now doing that for 165 people on the first Friday in February, and they all love it, right? They get a pizza delivered to their house, and then they through our Zoom, That's our, nice. net, our what do they call it, our lounge. A yeah. Zoom channel. They're all throwing pictures in there, and you know, talking about how great the pizza was. And it just takes, you know, uh, to thank you for that miserable January that they all have to go through. Have you tried Kahoot yet? I'm not sure. Like, have you seen that with Zoom? No, no. It's just it's like an app where you could it connects to Zoom with uh -huh. your phone, and you could ask it. You could do a survey. You could ask questions, and they're they're you know going. So they're popping up on the screen in Zoom, you know, okay. um, and it kind of makes it interactive as opposed yeah. to, um, you know, it's nice when people speak, obviously, but somebody may right. want to just throw up something. Yeah. And um, it's like, uh, it's, yeah, look, look it up. It's Kahoot, K-A-H. I'm not, I'm not trying to endorse them, but it's really a right, right. product that integrates with um, Zoom for like teams. Yep. Uh, if you're brainstorming or if doing things like that, it's actually yeah. kind of neat. Um, but very anxious. But I, I mean, do you, any of your, this just came up when you're talking about you're in 40 different cities. Is there ever any, well, that was back, that was back then. No, not today. It's all right. So you're, <laughs> you're all over the place. So <laughs> yeah. do you, do you have little pockets of, uh, places where maybe some of the team members get together for whatever reason? Like maybe you want to know it, that it's funny because in the beginning it was really a diverse, uh, location for everybody yeah. we do have pockets now in fact we have some people that live within you know dr uh, you know a short drive of each other yeah. uh so we have some pockets in arizona texas um georgia is turning into another pocket where there's a number of people north carolina and uh and some people actually it's really talk about a small world right some people once they meet here they realize that they know each other already from church Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I'll even tell you a, a funny one. So we hired an assistant controller not too long ago. And uh, like, like, like I said, I meet with them. So they give me a little bio on the person. And yep. he actually went to the same high school that I did, which meant he lived in the same town when I was you know, young in New Jersey. Yeah. And uh, so I get on the phone with them and it turned out that he went to the same high school and town was called Clifton, New Jersey. And uh, he, he spent most of his young life there. He got married and they relocated to Texas and that's where he's, he's out of now. So that was the closest it ever got for me. So yeah. who lived in the same town where I grew up, but it's turning into a very small world. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And they do get together. We do encourage them. 
to get together, um, you know, a couple times a year. It's not like a weekly thing. Um, and we do, you know, ask them to give us the bill for it. So it's a little social Friday night gathering, you know, go for dinner or, you know, pizza or, or yeah, you know, go to the bowling alley, whatever you want to do and, you know, get together and, and build that uh, camaraderie that is, is definitely, you know, something that you don't have when you're. It is actually. nice. Cause you know, even in our, we're, we're much smaller, obviously, but, um, creating that camaraderie so that maybe, uh, one of the team members wants to ask someone else how to do or a question on something mm -hmm. and they, it, it just may be easier for them to almost like a mentor relationship where they could, they know each other and go, Hey, I'm working on this client or whatever. And I have a quick question. Maybe, you know, have you seen this or that yeah. sort of thing? So it's kind of nice to create that little bit. Yeah. The camaraderie be camaraderie between the members that are all spread out all over the country. So, well, you talked about how do they kind of, you know, get together. And one of the yeah. ways is when they first start, we, we will most times start two or three people at the same time to, to go through that month long training. So those two or three people become a little pod within the company. And while they may go their own ways and work with other people, inevitably they've built a little bit of a bond with each other. It's like going to grade school and you walk in and you know, you're in, you're assigned to a classroom and you become friendly with the kids around you. And all of a sudden right. they become your friends at that point. You may go to different classes after that, but right. initially that connection gets made when you first come together. Cause in a sense, they're all in the same boat. They know nothing and they're all here to, you know, onboard and, and learn, you know, how to become part of the team. So interesting. It, it, it lasts and people are friends with yeah. people even after they've left. Um, and so those relationships, uh, you know, continue on. It's a, it's very interesting dynamic. Yeah. It's kind of cool thinking that you're creating this ecosystem of, you know, these friendships that are happening in the <laughs> right. across the country. And it's, it's just not, you know, um, it's people go on vacation and it's, yeah, but it's somebody will go on vacation to an area where there's other people that they, maybe they work with, they'll get together for lunch or dinner or something like that. Uh, that, yeah, that's, that's cool to be able yeah. to say, Hey, I'm, I'm going to I'm Florida or whatever. Um, right. and I'm going to be in Naples. I'm, on. <laughs> I'm sure you would come over and come yeah. on over. We'll go to eat. So, well, wherever, whenever Bill or I travel up until COVID, you know, we, we've sort of suspended that now because we don't want to you know, for, make anyone feel uncomfortable or yeah potentially have any problems with employees or their families. But up until two years ago, whenever we traveled anywhere, we would always have a get together um, for the people, one, two, three, 10, whatever it might be in a particular area. And again, so they're bonding now with, with us in a face to face. Uh, I did one about not too long ago, I, which I did do because I guess I made an exception for myself, um, but it was up in Sarasota where we have uh, about four or five employees and we, which is about hour and a half from me north of Naples. And mm -hmm. we got together one evening for, for dinner and, you know, had a nice time just chatting and talking. You know, it was in business. And at the end, yeah. they just, they all felt closer, um, not only to each other, but to like, me in this, in that regard, because they didn't kind of see me as the guy just on the other end of a, a zoom call. Yeah. I, you know, I think it helps. Like I have, um, someone who works here and every year there's an event for at her kid's school. Um, and this is, you know, I go, but we, we, um, brought a bunch of other team members and it was, we rented a shuttle. We went out to the event together and, you know, we came back and it seems like we're much, you know, closer as far as just, you know, that social, you know, um, environment kind of create a little glue as far as I know the person we hung out, chatted. it was outside of work right. and, um, it was kind of a nice bond that you create, you know, up so. until, uh. COVID two years ago, we were having uh, what we called an anniversary party every uh, every other year. And it was to celebrate people who were at back then five or 10 years with the company. And so mm -hmm. we pick a spot, we fly them there, we would uh, bring all the managers together, and then we would extend an offer to some of the other employees if they wanted to come. And it would just be a night together where we would celebrate the people who had been with us you know, for those milestones of five or 10, you yeah. know, a couple now or 15, um, years. And it was nice. It was really nice. You know, we, we look forward to getting back to it. And as you said, we do the same thing. We have team meetings, you know, we try to schedule at least once a year where we take the, 
management team to a location um, and you know, sort of do our strategy stuff. And, and then of course there's some bonding exercises to break, break everybody down. Um, yeah. Again, we've had to put that on hold with COVID. So they're all yearning for it. Uh, they actually yeah, sure. scheduled it. Uh, they scheduled it for March of this year. And then last month they, uh, or late early this month, they decided to suspend it because, you know, of uh, Omnicrom. So it better mm -hmm. that way. But yeah, well, well, they're already planning uh, something for the fall to fill it. That's back. awesome. Yeah. yeah. Do you uh, just changing the topic slightly? Um, yeah. In our industry, we've talked. And we always talk about just the technology changes. I mean, you, you know, what do you? How do you handle that? I mean, obviously, uh, AI and machine language and you know add-ons that do all different types of things in our in, a, in our accounting business. Um, Every year, seen, or less than every year, quite, <laughs> there's always something new coming out. And um, a lot of the stuff is good. Some of it may not be. Um, makes us not ready for prime but, time. Yeah. Not ready for prime time is, is what it would be in many cases. So we actually do have um, a technology department. Um, there are one and a half people in that department right now. And uh, they, they have a number of directives. One of those is to identify and, and vet and keep up with um, emerging products uh, so that we can see something. I, I go back to the bill.com days, you know, when bill.com first came out, it was at one of the Woodard concert, uh, Woodard uh, conferences. Right. And uh, we took one look at it and we were like, this is not ready for prime time. Uh, and uh, Renee would be at the show back then. That's how long right. ago this was. Right. And yeah. uh, so we dismissed it and, you know, two or three, four shows later, we're still seeing them there, but we put in our mind, it's no good. And then, I don't know, somewhere around 2007 or 2008, something like that, we took another look at it and we're like, this is the greatest thing from sliced bread. They had improved it, obviously. Yeah. The point was that we, we didn't have a process to, to watch something mature to a point where we could use it. And so now we've got this system where we're identifying different uh, options, uh, technologies, and we're looking at a whole bunch of them. Some we've actually implemented. We're trying Uncat, for example. Oh, we're uh, doing the same. Yeah, it came out of the gate strong. They yep. into it made some changes. It upset the Apple cart. We're kind of back to square one. You know, we've used Ledger Sync, uh, Vic AI. You know, we're looking at a number of these things. All uh, right, and 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 more importantly, we're beginning to monitor them to see. You know, do they progress to a point where, you know, it's worth putting putting clients on it, right? Or using it eternally. Yeah, yep. but it it is a it, it it is a dedicated person for us and. For most practices, you've got to have somebody who spent some of their time doing that. Otherwise, it's hard to keep up yeah. with it. it, it for me, I, that's me. <laughs> I yeah. like diving into these things. And I, you can only dedicate so much time. Right. It's tough. If it doesn't hit right away, like you said, you get a back burner. It, yep. it, it, and you move on. Right. Move on. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and just, um, you know, where, where do you see, what excites you about the future? Obviously, we... And we're in the bit same profession. We started out with the South source accounting. Um, we've moved more into, I guess, advisory, you know, becoming, um, knowledge workers as opposed to service workers and trying to impart, you know, some of this knowledge, because I think bookkeeping for the most part is becoming a commodity. You know, you got all these players out there that are trying to, you know, they're driving down prices, trying to outsource everything. Um, and so I, I know for us. We're trying to be more uh, advisors, and I'm just curious where you see even accountingdepartment.com going. You know? Well, I have been on the advisory uh, bandwagon now, probably coming up on about seven years. Um, so really before it became in vogue, yeah. uh, we were talking about it because I could sense the, the shift in the clients because of the quality of the work we do and that giving them that set of financials that they historically haven't had it be, over a period of time, it began to say, okay, now this is taken care of and it enabled them to start thinking about the next step. Yeah. And that next step is those advisory services. Um, and so we have been moving into it. We have been doing it. It's not for everybody. Not, a, you know, some businesses are just happy having a good set of books and knowing they can right. rely on that, uh, you know, every, each and every month. But for those that are looking to, to, to have that expertise brought to brought to the table. It is something that we, we have been offering for a couple of years. Um, so 
Yeah, it's an important yeah. part of, of where the future is going. We actually have moved upstream over the last, I'll say, 10 years. And what I mean by upstream is to sort of avoid, you know, the situation that you just talked about. And, you know, it's, it sounds like everybody just says it, um, but we actually did it. And I, what I mean by that is we're not fighting over price anymore. Um, yeah. We're working with clients who value accounting. And in order to, to find businesses that value accounting, you have to find businesses that are scaling. So, you know, your small business, they're the backbone of America, but it's a pain in their neck to have to deal with this stuff. And yes, they will change providers over a few dollars because they do view it as an expense. And, you know, the, again, the cliche, it's an asset, it's not an expense, you know, that kind of thing, or an investment, not an expense. Um, small businesses have a hard time. They'll always have a hard time because they're just looking at it as uh, it's a necessary evil. But when yeah. you get to a, a large scaled organization with departments and uh, different divisions and different locations and, uh, you know, a, a professional services firm with lots of service providers, they're looking for that kind of accounting that you can't get for a couple of hundred dollars a month. So in that regard, we moved away from that kind of end of the market. And with that has brought this expanded interest in advisory services and forecasting and budgeting. Yeah, right. I mean, we have a fair share of smaller clients who, you know, they just want to make sure their tax guy gets the right numbers at the end of the right. year and they're not even looking at it throughout the year. Right. Um, right. And you just feel like, you know, you're not really adding any value. Um, so it's, so I think yeah. it'd be, it's, it's going to be a harder shift for that, that type of a client to want to mm -hmm. buy advisory services because they're not looking at it. Um, as a, as something, they, a tool that they use to run their business. If they're using yeah. it for once a year tax return, it is what it is. They're, they're bread and butter. You shouldn't get rid of them. They're your foundation. They're going to give you the cash flow you need. But what you have to do is think about the next level you want to get to and what that kind of client looks like and go after that one. Because these low lying fruits will always be there. You can continue yeah. to add more and you'll lose a few and you'll add more and you'll have a net gain, I'm sure. Um, but over time, it'll, it'll, be the same grind, if you will, you know, right. businesses who want it for a tax return. So use that base as the catapult to, to take it to the next step. Yep. Now that make to makes total sense. So easier said than done though. It, it is easier. <laughs> uh, yeah. We, even as a, my own company and I'm not, I'm not sure if you guys do this too, but every year we kind of look at our non-ideal clients, right. And which, you know, those ones may be paying you know and um but for many reasons they may not be ideal maybe their systems are different than what we're used to and they're just off in a different direction or you know they want services that are a stretch for us to handle um you know the we we tend to try to unload those type of clients because we're always looking to bring in the ideal ones that we have a list of so um well when you go back to how did we scale this is this is an important part of that event that history of how that happened yeah you know, when, we, when we first started um we were in the dark age right so nobody was looking for these services so we had to go out and sell it so it was what i call the error of education for accountingdepartment.com we were educating what were then small businesses probably many of the clients that you service now and one of the first obstacles we came across was well what if i don't like it what if i want it back and we're like no problem we're using quickbooks we'll just give you your file back you know you pick up where we left off. And so we made this, a lot of things that happened. I hate to, you know, make it sound like it's greater than it is. We stumbled into them. We just stepped in the cow dunk that's in the pasture that <laughs> set the, set the future. And that, that dung that we stepped in was very simple. We only wanted to work with QuickBooks clients, but we only wanted to work with QuickBooks because it helped in that effort to sell the idea of outsourcing. And so over that first eight or 10 years, that's all we ever did. And we became really proficient at it. Mm -hmm. And we worked out all our systems and our processes and our checklists and everything was built around QuickBooks. So when other clients started to come along who maybe were in Peachtree or Sage or, you know, Great Plains or any of these other programs, we said, no, we said, no, unless you want to change to QuickBooks. Right. And so a lot just passed through our storefront and, and didn't buy because, you know, they didn't want to change. They couldn't change. And that was okay. But what we realized was we needed to be specialists 
and not a jack of all trades. Yeah. Right. The ones you start trying to dabble in not only different accounting applications, which I think you could master a little bit easier. We were kind of very focused, but what we definitely stayed away from is all these third party systems, not the apps that we talk about connecting with QuickBooks, but the third right. party systems that every industry has, and they want to continue to use, and they have to do some piece of accounting in it. That's got to get back into QuickBooks. And, and with that, they want us to be, you know, so we don't, we have no way to validate. We have no way to s scale that, right? I get one client comes along with some one product that we'll never see again. What good is that for me to dedicate a lot of resources that I can't get a return on? I need to invest in things that I can get a return on. Mm -hmm. And a return means I can continue to sell it without having to learn it every time. And so we just stayed on this path of, QuickBooks, desktop, and then of course we migrated. We're probably close to 70% of our clients are now in QuickBooks online. Okay. Uh, and then recently um, we did add NetSuite. Uh, wow. And so we did make the plunge about a year, year and a half ago now, it's, it was July of 20, where we signed on as a, uh, as a uh, software reseller for them and implementing it. Uh, we're converting clients to it. Uh, we're taking over clients that already have it. But we yeah. use our knowledge of how we set it up at QuickBooks to be able to fast track doing the same thing, you know, sure. with NetSuite. But that doesn't mean somebody else comes along with some other program and we're just going to jump and say yes, because it's still a learning process. Absolutely. And we're putting a lot into learning it in order to scale it and return on that investment in the future. So my advice would be get more focused and try not to be a, a jack of all trades to everybody is very easy because when the when you know that opportunity is in your hand but it's not what you're looking for it's so easy to say yes but then look at the time you're investing and in maybe not able to recover right. for that one one setup that you're trying to do yeah and like you're you're jumping in that suite a year and a half ago we started working with acumatica for some of our larger clients because right. you know we have like you some good clients that are growing um and at some point we were losing them because they outgrew quickbooks like you know we specialize yep. in as well and um you know i went back and forth on that decision do i just say hey that's our core is quickbooks and if they outgrow us well you know they do or well, we can't service them at that point but we started doing mm -hmm. the same thing you're doing with that so that's getting that's moving away from the commodity type work yeah, because now right. it's a value add. You know, the right. funny part, the funny thing is about about all these accounting softwares, it's nothing about the software. It's all about the people. <laughs> right. It's still, you got to have the people. I mean, we've yes. taken, we, we got into government accounting. So government accounting called DCA compliant accounting. Yeah. Uh, yep. Those are businesses that, that do contract work for the federal government. And, uh, you know, like everything else with the federal government, they got their own set of rules, including accounting. And so the way you have to keep your books is different than just gap, right? Mm -hmm. So we went out, we, we came across a couple of these clients. We were able to put together a package of software that was based around QuickBooks, adding on this third-party app that we didn't know at the time, but we were willing to invest in it because if we brought it on and it worked for this client, that meant we can duplicate it with other clients. So we identified that product. We, we went, well, about five of us went to Virginia, for three days to, to learn all about it. We then had to identify the compliant time and expense applications, which they need. We had the whole package. We put the marketing together. We then brought in a, a controller who actually was a controller in a government contractor. So they knew the language, they knew the, uh -huh. the technical aspects of it. So sure. we were able to build out a department that specializes in providing government accounting. Now, a number of those businesses, when they first would start talking to us, they're on the high-end accounting products. Yeah. They're on, they're on Dell tech or cross Dell tech. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're struggling with it or they want it. They're, they're too small of a contractor for the cost of a Dell tech or a, or a cross. Yeah. They're trying to make QuickBooks work on its own. Right. And they can't. They're out of accounts and classes. Right. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It does, it, on its own, it, it can't do what you need. Right. Yeah. So we had that magic sauce of a couple of different add-ons that we could then deploy and present mm -hmm. the whole package. But in the end, we said, you got, if you want us, you're going to have to come off of, or not want to go to, you know, Crosspoint or, or Dell tech. And, you know, and for some, they said yes. And others, they would say no, and that's okay. Yep. You know, you'll find another way to 
you know, meet your needs. Yeah. But right. yeah, you had to stick with your core because once you start going off that path, you you just you you just create a lot of extra work for yourself, um, and it, it builds in a lot of inefficiencies, which ultimately means money coming out of your pocket. Right. Only your pocket, unless your employees help share in that <laughs> yeah. cost. Okay, I, I didn't. I thought maybe you might be different than the rest of us. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, um, just we talk about business. Just let's talk about you. Just in general, like who are you? Like who? Where did Dennis come from? And um, you know, you're fr- you know, obviously you're in Naples now, but you're not from Naples. I, I know you mentioned New Jersey. So yep, grew yep. up in New Jersey. I grew up in New Jersey. Uh, spent my first. A lot of years married, 20, I don't know, 25 years married life, 27 years married life in New Jersey, raised three kids, you know, over time they went, they went away to college. And, and then now uh, when the youngest was, I guess, in the third year, I said to my wife, do we really need to be here anymore? Because, you know, I don't like the cold weather. So it was a little bit of a tussle, but uh, she said, okay, let's try Florida. I have a sister that lives down there. We'll go yep. by her. So her sister happens to live in Naples. Uh, and so we came down here and, you know, it's been six years, um, bought and sold two homes now and kind of moving around a little bit to find the right place and the right community. Yeah. But we like it. I like the warm weather. Um, I, I wear shorts and a polo shirt every day. And, you know, if I'm lucky, I'll put shoes on. You don't miss New Jersey. It sounds like. I don't miss the. It was crowded. I don't miss the cold weather. I never liked it. I mean, I would have, uh, left New Jersey, uh, you know, five years into my marriage. If I had left before I got married, it probably would have been the best scenario, but then I wouldn't have everything I have today. Right. So I stuck it out, married a wonderful woman, three wonderful kids, and uh, they've all got careers now. And, and uh, what, our where, did you, done. where did you, where did you do your public experience? I started out at Cooper's and Librand. Okay. Same as me, yeah. actually. Did my, uh, I like to call it my indentured servitude then, yeah. uh, or there, I should say. Uh, and then after that, uh, a very common path, I, I got uh, solicited by one of my smaller clients to come in as their controller. So, you know, I left public. It turned out not to be a full-time gig. So I started a, a, a small practice on the side. And uh, and after a couple of years, the, the business didn't work out. And so I had the fallback of my career, of my practice. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I had that practice pretty much as the crossover. Uh, with this business until it's got its, you know, sea legs. And, and then I wound it down and uh, sold off most of the business wow. at that wow. point. So sounds it's like been, jur- quite the journey. Yeah. It's been self-employment for, you know, pretty much I'm coming up on 40 years as a CPA. So, um, you know, probably 35 of them have been uh, self-employed. Yeah. yeah. It's nice. And we both, well, we both worked at Cooper's. So we're alone. Yeah. You, yep. You, know, you were, was you was lost this. Yeah. I was in Newark, New Jersey. So yeah. I don't know where you start. I always like to tell my kids this because they, they hear this is funny and people who hear salaries like, you know, what CPAs make today. So, um, you know, I, when I was, a se- I guess, a senior in college, you know, the all the big eight back then, yep. you know, they come in the recruiting. I had multiple offers from, I don't know, four out of the eight or five out of the eight. Um, but then one decided they want to wine and dine me. So they took me to a basketball game at, uh, in Dork. Uh, something like that. And they, yeah. you know, took me out to dinner and then they had me do the internship. And before the internship was over, they, they wanted to offer me, you know, a, I guess a staff A person at the time or staff B, whatever they call yep. it. Now. Staff B, yeah. Staff B, I guess, right? Yeah, you go from B to A. Um, and so I was all excited and they said, well, we normally offer 18,000 to start, but we're going to start you at 18.5 Ooh. because you... You know, you did the internship yeah. program. I was like, wow, 18.5. What year? I'm sure you don't mind. T- what year? That would have been 1982. Okay. Yeah, that was the year I graduated college. So I or, started in 1988. Um, so I'm a couple of years younger than you. And it was yeah. 27,000 was what I got as his first salary. So it has increased over uh, six yeah. years or so. So yeah. yeah, I still I still look back at that 18.5. You couldn't even... Uh, you know, be on the unemployment list for that. It's no, right. Pretty poultry exactly. earnings. So, yeah, but that's where it all started. All right. Cool. And lastly, passions. I know you golf. Do you do anything? Now you're in Florida. Do you do any kind of boating? Do you do any, uh, you're at the I try, I try boating. boating. I, I, draw, I joined, I have, I have not seen one alligator. Okay. Been here. Everybody talks about alligators and every time they bring up alligators, I remind them 
because I was actually looking for alligators when I first came. I was like, I really want to see these alligators up front, yeah. prehistoric looking. And uh, six years later, I have yet to see one alligator, although I have encountered a bear twice oh. in my community. Yeah, we're, we're, we're we back up to a preserve. Uh, and so there's there's a lot of wildlife down here, uh, bears, coyotes, deer. Uh, and so uh, one morning I was taking the garbage out and the bear came from the side of my house. He was, well, you know, the story goes, he's big, right? But yeah. he had to be a couple of hundred pounds and he paid no mind to me. He just walked across my driveway and, you know, onto the next property and kept going. So, um, so I, I just, I did, I did recently start, uh, some golf, uh, less than a year ago, you know, it's a thing when you get down here, right? Everybody says, would you, do you play golf? Cause they want to, that's a big right. social activity. And I got, honestly, I got tired of saying no. Um, and so I said to my wife, uh, last April or something, I said, would you like to take some golf lessons? And she said, okay. So we went and we found a course not too far from the house and have found a pro and he's a young kid and he's very patient. And, uh, and so don't tell, hopefully my employees don't listen to this, but every Wednesday now I go for lessons in the afternoon because nobody works down here on the weekends. Um, I'm a big sci-fi nut. Uh, so that's what I'm into and, uh, technology. So those are my, uh, those are my things. Wow. That's kind of cool. Uh, I like a nice bourbon and, uh, you know, give me a football game and a cigar. And I'm happy there too. All right, I'm going to have to come down and visit you. I'll bring the bourbon. I got some right here in my office. <laughs> oh, do you really? Well, I got, we got <laughs> well, looking at it. <laughs> I mean, we got a lot of nice bourbon places down here. So it's an up and coming thing. And and when next time, if you buy a golf cart, we just picked up a client that uh, sells parts to customize golf carts. Uh, any, oh, deck them out. You need. Yeah. I've seen a couple in my community. One guy's got a, got a decked out like a, a Cadillac. Yeah. That's all the <laughs> stuff they sell. Right. Exactly. So <laughs> cool. Well, where can we find you? I know you're on LinkedIn, right? Well, the company is accountingdepartment.com, all spelled out. So those are two easy words to remember accountingdepartment.com. And I'm Dennis.Najar, uh, N A J J A R, at accountingdepartment.com. All right. Cool. LinkedIn. And, yep. You find me there Facebook, Instagram. I've seen you on LinkedIn. Um, you know, Dennis Najar, all spelled out. Um, Cool. Yeah. Well, I, I want to thank you. It's uh, been a long, good conversation. Uh, I know I learned a lot and I'm, and I'm sure that anyone listening to this is going to pick up a lot. I mean, it's just a great um, story of, of, a, of you guys scaling um, and knowing from the start what you want to do. Cause I, a lot of times I don't see that in a lot of my own clients, they kind of just organically grow or not grow. Um, and they don't end up they don't even know where they're going to end up. So it's nice that you guys from the start said, Hey, this is where we want to go. Um, well, it does help to have somebody to compete that with, you know, it was like, you know, we kind of coach each other on and onward and forward. Um, so I, you know, got to give credit to the fact that it's not just me alone. You know, Bill been with me since day one and we just journeyed this together and he's a great guy. He's, I, I see him every morning for an hour and sometimes nice. I feel like he's my wife, my second wife. My, my work wife or whatever they call it. I think they right, work, work wife, work, exactly. work spouse or something. <laughs> so uh, it's been a fun ride and uh, we got a couple of years to, to go. That's good. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to watching you guys keep going. Um, oh, continued success to you as well, Jeff. I've done thanks. it for a number of years and uh, you're a great guy. Yeah, okay. thank you. And you and Bill are awesome. So I'm, I'm glad you um, allowed me to talk to you today. And so my pleasure. I, th I want to thank you again. I want to encourage anyone who's listening um, to like and share this, um, invite anyone else that you think would be interested. And, um, thanks Dennis. And this has been another episode of leaders who scale. And that wraps up another episode. Thank you for joining for show notes and other episodes. Visit us at leaders who scale.com leaders who scale is sponsored by Siegel solutions providing world-class services and cutting edge tools that help businesses grow and succeed.